let's now talk about vaccine development. With so many different vaccines already developed, why is this different? Well, during SARS in 2002, 2003, and the MERS outbreak that occurred in 2012, vaccine manufacturers got started with the development of vaccines for these specific coronavirus epidemics. Just as flu antigens are different, also the coronaviruses also have differences. This is one of the reasons why we have a different flu vaccine each season is because of those changes in the antigens. While there is, there was a start on the vaccine development for each of those outbreaks, the research was halted as the diseases were either contained geographically or disappeared before a vaccine was developed. There are over 200 COVID-19 vaccines in initial development. Operation Warp Speed, OWS, aims to deliver 300 million doses of a safe and effective vaccine or co for COVID-19 by January of 2021. This is part of a broader strategy to accelerate the development, manufacturing, and distribution of not only the COVID-19 vaccines, but also therapeutics and diagnostics. These are collectively known as countermeasures. Any vaccine developed for, COVID, uh, for the COVID-19 must be proven to be both safe and effective. Many times you'll hear about a vaccine's efficacy. Efficacy refers to the results in a controlled situation, where effectiveness, however, is how well it works in the community. We need to know that a vaccine will be both effective in the community situations that are not controlled and will result in a robust and protective immune response. During this pandemic, some have argued that we should allow the disease to run its course and have the population develop natural immunity. It takes approximately 90% of the community to have immunity, either from the vaccine or from having had, have recovered from the disease and having high enough levels of antibodies to be protective. Recent estimates are that as a country, we have an immunity level of approximately 10%. In talking about vaccine effectiveness and the relationship to herd immunity, let's say that a vaccine was found to have an effectiveness of about 70%. This would leave 30% of vaccinated individuals unprotected and 100% of unvaccinated individuals susceptible to this disease. Further, realize that when it is an efficacy rate that is reported, the actual effectiveness of, of that vaccine in the community setting could actually be much lower. Other considerations we need to make. Is there enough of a risk from the disease that a vaccine is needed? In this case, absolutely. Does the vaccine work on all individuals regardless of their gender, their age, their ethnicity, or other comorbid con conditions that they may have? What are the challenges in the transporting of the vaccine? and are there going to be storage issues? And how hard is it going to be for individuals to be able to access the vaccine? Does it require special administration techniques or equipment or what other barriers exist? Let's now talk about vaccine development and the process. What you see here is how a new vaccine is developed, approved and manufactured. And this occurs in different phases. And many of you have heard about different phases being announced as each of the vaccine candidates have been going through this research process. Let's take a moment and talk about these different phases. What you see in phase one is that there are approximately 20 to 100 healthy volunteers. Now, I like to reinforce the word healthy volunteers. So this is not testing a vaccine on individuals who may have other comorbid conditions, may be elderly or may have some other circumstance. These are healthy volunteers. And those healthy, uh, in those healthy volunteers, they're trying to determine is the vaccine safe? Does the vaccine seem to be effective and work? Are there any serious side effects that they note in those individuals vaccinated? And how is the dosage or the size of the dose related to the side effects? Now in phase two, what you're seeing is several hundred volunteers in the phase two of a trial. And in this uh, trial, again, we're looking to see what is the most common short-term side effects. How are the volunteers' immune systems responding to the vaccine? Are they developing antibodies? And later in phase three, this is where we start to see hundreds or thousands of volunteers that are incorporated into the, into the research process.
So we're using individuals of diverse backgrounds in phase three studies. We're also looking at different age groups. And in these hundreds or thousands of volunteers, we're trying to determine how do the people who get the vaccine and the people who do not get the vaccine compare? Is the vaccine safe? Is the vaccine going to be effective? And what are the most common side effects? FDA licenses a vaccine only when it's found to be safe and effective. It has to be determined that the benefits are going to outweigh any risks from the vaccine. Our ANA President Grant volunteered to participate in a COVID-19 vaccine phase three clinical trial at the University of Carolina in Chapel Hill, in part because the virus is dis disproportionately affecting communities of color. In his comments, he stated, there's a need for more minor minority participation in clinical studies like this because COVID-19 is mostly affecting black and brown populations. Grant further said in the interview that we need to gather enough evidence of whether the vaccine will help in these populations. And if the vaccine is approved, people of color will be more inclined to try it if they know people who look like them participated safely in the trials. Although there are a number of different vaccines in re the research pipeline, there are four that are the furthest along in the clinical trials. Some of these vaccines will require booster doses to be administered at least 21 to 28 days following the initial dose. The different vaccines are not interchangeable. The technology of several of these vaccines, such as the messenger RNA vaccines, are not currently in licensed use. The speed outlined in this slide refers to the speed with which these vaccines are being developed. Let's now discuss how the COVID-19 vaccines actually work. You will note on the surface of the coronavirus, there are several projections. These projections are the spike proteins. In searching for solutions to the COVID-19 pandemic, researchers have focused on the spike protein, which plays a key role in the virus's ability to bind with and to infect healthy cells. This protein is the focus of the current COVID vaccine research. What you see in the current candidates, these are the five um, candidates that are the furthest along in the research trials. You can see that two of these are messenger RNA technology and the other three are using uh, vectors. Some of those are using uh, replication vectors and others are using recombinant uh, vesicular stomatitis vectors. Let's talk for a moment about how these actually work. Messenger RNA-based vaccine candidates is a new technology, and this has not pre previously been used in human vaccines. In this approach, the vaccine contains a messenger RNA, and this messenger RNA is processed in cells to make proteins. Once the proteins are produced, the immune system will make a response or mount a response against them to create immunity. In this case, the protein produces the COVID-19 spike protein. No currently licensed vaccines use this approach. And rather than inject the coronavirus spike proteins directly, the vaccines deliver genetic instructions via this messenger RNA that will make their way into the shoulder muscles where the vaccine is delivered. The messenger RNA vaccines function on the premise that this uh, messenger RNA that's coded for the pathogen antigen can be delivered to the human cells. And once it's there, it can be used for production of antigen within the cells. This is a unique technology in that it would lead to a robust immunologic response without the introduction of a live, killed, or even subunit portions of the pathogen of, of interest. However, because the messenger RNA are highly susceptible to um, extracellular extracellular ribonucleases and rapidly degraded, its use depends on the inclusion of other systems that will also um, be able to prevent that from happening. Moderna and Pfizer in concert with uh, BibliantTech are the two front runners that are using this messenger RNA based uh, vaccine technology. Now there's a difference between the replicating viral vector vaccines. So unlike the messenger RNA vaccines, this vaccine actually uses a weakened uh, virus, such as a common cold or adenovirus. And once this uh, vaccine is in the muscle cells, the, mes the messenger RNA instructs those cells to produce the coronavirus spike proteins and then trigger that immune response. So there's both those that will replicate and there's those that are non-replicating. 
similar to um, the messenger RNA, what happens is the body is able to recognize those proteins and be able to mount an immune response. There are currently no uh, licensed uh, vaccines that are using this technology, but three that are under investigation are using this technology to address the COVID-19. Now, there's a lot of other technologies that are also being used that some of them have already been used in other vaccines. So uh, you'll recognize many of these, such as inactivated vaccines, where the whole virus is killed with a chemical and used to make the vaccine. And this is the same uh, vaccine approach that's used in some of the current uh, vaccines that we have on the market, such as polio, the injectable polio vaccine, hepatitis A and our rabies vaccines. Now, subunit vaccines use a piece of the virus that's important for immunity, like the spike protein of the COVID-19. And this would be used to make the, vac the vaccine. This is the same approach that we use to make things like our hepatitis vaccine and our HPV vaccine. Another technology is where we use the weakened live uh, viral vaccine, where the vaccine is grown in the lab in cells different from those that it infects in people. Um, and as the vaccine um, gets better at growing in the lab, then it becomes less capable of reproducing in people. And this weakened virus is used to make the vaccine. When the weakened, vi weakened virus is given to people, it can reproduce enough to generate immune response, but not enough to make that person sick. This is the same approach that we use to, in the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, chickenpox, and some of the rotavirus vaccines that we currently have on the market. Finally, there's DNA vaccines. And what this is very similar to the messenger RNA, except that the gene that codes for the uh, COVID-19 spike protein is inserted into a small circular piece of DNA uh, called the plasmid. And these plasmids are then injected as the vaccine. There is currently no DNA vaccines uh, on the market. Thank you.